everyone. Um, so yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about pricing. Um, I'm not a one trick pony though, so I have some other things we can talk about as well. Uh, to kind of get stuff started though, if you're someone like me who likes to have the slides and like to take notes and all that kind of fun stuff, um, you can go to priceintelligent.com slash microconf. Um, there's a landing page. If you don't want to give me your email address, just put like face at microconf.com or something like that. We can spam Rob essentially. Um, but the, um, I won't actually spam you, Rob, wherever you went. He's not even listening. Anyways, um, so the big thing that we're going to talk about today is kind of alluded to by the title is really this concept of building a software business, and I would argue a business in general, is something that's deceptively simple. Um, there's so many tactics that have been talked about already. There's so many tactics that I heard last night. Uh, but we like to make it super, super complicated. Uh, and we're gonna go through a lot of different information here that we've seen inside a lot of these different companies that we worked with, and then ultimately provide you guys with some good tactics and some good frameworks to not only get your customer development right, but ultimately to get your pricing correct, or at least on the right track. Um, and to kind of kick things off, a um, little bit of the origin story here, and these pictures were chosen very specifically because, let's be honest, realistic. Um, anyways. <laughs> Um, but uh, self-deprecating, love it. Anyways, uh, so my background's in econometrics and math. Um, I started my career working for the intelligence community, um, and I mentioned that just to alienate you guys even further. Um, but after working um, in DC and at Fort Meade, I went and worked at Google, where I did something very, very similar, interestingly enough. Um, in my entire career, I did what was called value modeling, which is the whole concept of taking a bunch of data uh, and really getting towards an output. So at the NSA, hunting terrorists, at Google, hunting more money. Um, and what's really, really fascinating about that is a lot of the data that we work with inside SaaS companies actually has a lot of applicable information for finding that particular value for your customer or just the value of your company in general. Um, so a little bit more specifically about the companies, and it's all one company, and we actually do have software. We're not just consulting. Um, but what we did is we started Price Intelligently about four years ago, um, and we had a couple of algorithms that we developed that basically got to customer value. So we're able to measure things like price elasticity or relative preference of different features and different products. Um, and we started scaling that as an actual software product. And then we discovered that selling that for 50 bucks a month, ironically, a really, really bad price, wasn't really gonna get us where we wanted to go because there are a lot of different issues with the product in and of itself. We found that a lot of people who came to us and were asking us about pricing were basically like, hey, we'll pay you just to do this for us. And not being you know, too ego egomaniacal around, oh, we want pure touchless sales and product, we said, OK. Um, and that's how we were able to self-fund or customer fund our business in general. Um, and then about two years ago, what we ended up finding is we we're actually sitting in a boardroom of a company that was about to go public in the next six to nine months. Um, and that's as specific as I can get for them in particular. But we were going through their numbers in, in really kind of specific order. And what we discovered was is they were calculating something as seemingly simple as MRR incorrectly. Um, and that's because it's not a gap metric. Your CFO of a public company or a large company doesn't really need to have their SaaS metrics to be accurate. But when they were going on their roadshow, essentially they discovered that that was millions of dollars in market cap that they were missing, or at least that's what they told us to make us feel better. Um, so about two years ago, we started working on ProfitWell, which is essentially free financial metrics for subscription businesses. Um, and that's kind of taken off and we're doing really, really well. Um, with that particular product across many of these different SaaS companies. And I'm not telling you this to essentially sell you on anything, but I'm telling you this just to give a perspective that from at least from a financial perspective, we've seen inside more subscription businesses than anyone else out there. Um, we have about 1,800 companies using ProfitWell. We have a few hundred companies like Atlassian and some of the other logos that you've seen on the previous slide that we've worked with in terms of pricing. And what's really fascinating about a lot of these companies is that as we continue to dig through the data and just as we continue to have these different conversations, both in a very high touch capacity on price intelligently side, but also in a lower touch capacity on the profit well side, we decided to discover these really clear groups start to emerge. Um, now the one group we call the LTV beasts or the lifetime value beasts. So lifetime value, for those of you who don't know, it's basically a measure of your retention and how well you are at monetizing or pricing over your, um, or yeah, that's the measure of it, not the LTV to CAC, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and then the CAC fiends. These are essentially the customer acquisition cost fiends. These are folks who are really, really focused on growth through actual costs of acquisition. Now what's fascinating about this, at least qualitatively, what we started to discover is that these LTV beasts had very, very low amounts of funding relative to their size. So someone like Atlassian, you know, they've raised $100 million, they've gone public, 
but they didn't raise a ton of money to get to that particular point. They also have 10x sales teams or no sales teams in general. Um, these are the folks that are extremely efficient at actual acquisition. And then finally, they know their buyer personas and their unit economics like the back of their hand. You can walk into the company, you can ask the CEO all the way down to the entry level marketer who they're selling to, and they'll give you a half hour discussion about this is the buyer, this is what they look like, this is the team size, this is what they like, this is what their willingness to pay looks like. But this contrasted pretty starkly with these CAC fiends who were essentially the polar opposites of these individuals. These are folks that have raised more money than God. Doesn't mean they've raised $100 million, but it does mean they've raised a lot of money relative to their size. They have 1x sales teams. These are the types of companies that you walk into and it's 30 people and 16 of them are salespeople or even scaling up 700 people at a DevOps product and 400 of them are salespeople. Um, and they don't know their buyers. You walk in, you talk to a CEO and they say, developers? What kind of developers? And they can't really go in depth. And I'm setting this up not to you know, kind of wax nostalgic about you know, some of the customers that we've seen, but these are the two groups that we see typically in the market. And as we dig deeper and deeper into some data here, what you'll start to find is that these lifetime value beasts, these companies that we all want to be, it's actually a very, very small portion of the market. And those folks are the ones who are crushing it, for the lack of a better cliche phrase, basically because they're so focused on their unit economics and specifically so focused on their buyer personas. So based on all this data, do we have a unified theory of SaaS growth? No, I don't have magical powers quite yet. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk through these three big trends. And then the second half of the presentation, we're going to give you those frameworks to hopefully make sure that you're not falling into some of these pitfalls, whether you're just starting your business or you've been growing for many, many years. Um, there's a lot of applicable knowledge in here, let alone some benchmarks for you that are going to be helpful. And the three big things that we're gonna talk about today is a lot of times these CAC fiends, these folks who aren't really talking to their customers, they typically focus on the wrong benchmarks. They're chasing the wrong problems within their business. These folks don't take customer development seriously. We've talked a lot about customer development today already. And then finally, they focus way too much on acquisition. And that's where we'll get into pricing, monetization, and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and to translate this, and hopefully, this is a very unique group in the sense that we're not in this category, but some of us probably are, whether we like to admit it. And frankly, there's some stuff in here that just for the nature of time and priorities, we also need to get better at as well. So hopefully this will be a really, really good way that we all can get better within our businesses. So the first point here is really focusing on benchmarks. So right now, if you search, for example, Google or Quora for what's the average gross churn rate, and we've all done this or been forwarded in an article, typically what you end up seeing is um, a VC or someone who's you know, very, very interested in you using their product to reduce churn will talk about how you know, when they sold their company to X company, it was X percent, and then here's you know, three to five different you know, basically pinpoints in the market to help you basically understand that your gross churn should be at 5%. Um, so this is something that we see really, really commonly. The other thing that you tend to see are articles written about, well, we want lower gross churn, um, which is definitely the truth. But oftentimes, when we look at 5%, a lot of companies, what ends up happening is they get to 5% and they assume they just have to stop. And in some cases, that might be true. Like, that's the very nature of a benchmark. If you notice that one particular part of your business is going really, really well, you might put it on the back burner for another type of business. But what we found by looking at about 600 different companies, and the way that we broke this data down was based on the LTV to CAC ratio. So that's basically a measure, for those of you who don't know, of the efficiency of your business. A lot of us in this room really care about it since we're self-funded, and we can't just cack our way to success. But what was really, really fascinating is that 5% benchmark was really in the weakest subset of companies. Those companies that had LTV to CAC ratios of two or less. Now those companies that had between two and five, those folks who had hit that threshold and the magic number that a lot of people talk about is three, those were actually closer to just below 4%. And then those folks absolutely just crushing it, once again, for the lack of a better cliche, gross churn was actually closer to 2%. Now what's interesting about this data is if you stopped at 5%, you might actually not be chasing the right, number, right numbers within your business. Now we'll do a full write-up on this because there's a lot of other variables and we'll pass that along to the community here. Um, but it's one of those things where when you're focusing on your business, as we've talked about, we need to focus on the right benchmarks. Now, just to give you another one here, what percent of total sales is expansion revenue? Um, 
Expansion revenue, for those of you who don't know, basically upsells, basically getting your business to you know, make more money off your existing customers rather than filling your growth with new customers. Kind of the nomenclature out there, if you ask David Scott or look at the Pacific Crest survey, you're looking at 10 to 15%. In reality, what we found is that those customers who are doing really, really well, or those companies that are doing really, really well, they're almost in the 35% range. Those companies that are doing the worst, those are the ones who are around 10 to 15%. So it's something to keep in mind as you continue to look at where you have those different levers in your business. And just to kind of close this point out here, let's look at how fast you should be growing or how much you should be growing year over year. What's really fascinating is mostly everything out there says as much as possible. And that's true, right? You know, we want to grow as fast as possible and as much as possible. But as some of the other folks who were asking questions in the previous talk were talking about, sometimes you want to slow down a little bit. You want to make sure that you're building the right product for the right customer at the right price. And so because of that, here's an interesting benchmark for you guys across not the LTV to CAC ratio this time, but really around ARR, like how much money that these folks already were bringing in on a recurring revenue basis. And you'll notice that those folks, less than 100K a year, they're growing substantially, right? And the variance is really, really high. And then as this scales down, you know, it's naturally intuitive that a $5 million company isn't going to be doubling or tripling every single year here. So the point here, understand your metrics. A lot of these companies don't understand their unit economics, and then they don't understand what to focus on. Something that's really, really, really important, because as we intuitively know, if we don't know what to focus on and we're not focusing on the right things, there's going to end up being some trouble down the road as you continue to try to scale your business in a really, really efficient way. Next up here is, and this gets to be a little bit more tactical, um, we don't really do customer development seriously, and I'm talking in the aggregate here, and I have some data to back up that statement. But just as a social experiment here, and this might backfire just because of the nature of the group here, how many of you have buyer personas written out? Okay. Of those, keep your hands up, sorry. Of those who have buyer personas, how many of those buyer personas are in a central document that anyone on your team can access? Keep your hands raised. How many of those buyer personas do you have broken down by unit economics? So you know your CAC, your LTV for your different buyers. So we lost everyone. Um, great. Uh, and I have about four more questions, too. Willingness to pay, best features, worst features, usage metrics. This is the type of buyer persona you want. HubSpot's been talking about buyer personas for a decade and a half. And their summary is you know, a cute avatar and like a pretty picture, basically, of you know, table stakes Tony and some cute name. In reality, you want to know your buyers more intimately. Well, that's a really weird way to describe it, sorry. But you want to know your buyers better than anyone else in the history of your business. And the reason for that is because if you know what's valued, you know what's least valued, you know willingness to pay, you know your CAC, you know your LTV, you know your usage metrics, what you're able to do is align your entire business around those particular buyers. And as we saw in this room, and we'll hopefully help you get some of that work done, we all have a little bit of work to do to get this better. And to make you feel a little better, though, we have some good uh, industry stats. So these are about 1,400 companies, um, all in the SaaS and subscription space. Um, most folks, over half of them, they've thought about them. And that's kind of where a lot of you are. Like, you, don't, you know things about your buyers. Like, it's not like you know nothing. It's one of those things where it might not be codified and not be, might be quantified. Um, only about three out of 10 of them have some sort of central document. And then less than one out of 10 of them have some sort of quantified buyer persona. And that's kind of like what we were showing on the previous slide, but not necessarily exactly. Um, we don't really do a lot of cust dev conversations. This is another thought experiment or social experiment we could do here. Most folks are having less than 10 customer development conversations with or each month through their customer base. Um, not a lot of folks are doing more than that, less than one out of 10 out of the next three categories. And so the excuse here is, well, you'll do surveys. Well, a lot of us don't do a lot of surveys. Um, you know, most of us are doing no surveys per month or averaging out. Um, there's a small portion of us who's sending one customer development survey a month, and then a very, very small part of the population is doing more than those. And then the next kind of excuse here is we'll do testing. Um, well, we're not really testing that much either or running experiments. Um, just under five out of 10 of us are running no experiments or averaging no experiments per month. Um, you know, three out of 10 of us, about one to three, and then a very, very small portion are doing more and more experiments. And as some of the growth folks, you know, if you talk to Lars or you talk to Brian Balfour or any of these other folks that are out there, you know, they'll tell you that experimenting, even if you're just focused on acquisition, is probably the one leading indicator of your actual top of the funnel growth. 
So I'm not here to try to make you feel bad or anything because you know, price intelligently, we're not running as many tests and experiments as we should be either. But I am here to say that this should be a little bit scary to you. Um, because remember, deceptively simple. We have all the tactics, we all have collective knowledge around building a business, but a lot of us aren't doing our homework and that's making it actually extremely hard. And to think about it another way, in your business, everything leads to a page like this or a conversation that asks someone for a credit card or an invoice or to sign a contract. And if you don't know who that buyer is, then you don't know who to drive to that particular page, to that point of conversion, and you don't know how you're gonna actually justify that price. So it's something that's that important, and frankly, it's something that we see that separates those LTV beasts from the CAC fiends most staunchly. Um, this next data is very, very qualitative, just to be very, very clear, because I'm gonna put percentages up and people then freak out and assume it's quantitative sometimes. Um, but of 102 companies that we've studied over the past year who have failed, um, this is the past couple of years, I should say, who have failed miserably or had huge down rounds if they were venture-backed, 98% of them had no sort of quantified buyer persona. Most of them didn't have a central document either. And the flip side of this is once again very qualitative. Uh, about 80 companies that had exits of 8x of the original investment or more, or in the upper quartile of growth for kind of what we were seeing across these different companies, they had some sort of quantified buyer persona. So is this something that is gonna guarantee success? Absolutely not but it's one of those things that correlates to success and definitely has some lurking variables that actually help you based on what you're seeing within your business and basically helps you align. Um, so to kind of round out why people don't do this, um, there's two main arguments that we typically see. One is the Steve Jobs argument that I love. Um, and this, I get this one all the time when we talk about some of the stuff in the later part of the presentation here. Oh, you know, if I ask someone what they wanted, you know, they don't know what they want. If I ask them, or the Henry Ford quote as well, you know, if I asked them what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Um, and then Steve Jobs, you know, whoever said, you know, the customer's always right, was in fact a customer. What's interesting about that though is that both organizations, both Apple and Ford, actually do a ton of customer research. Um, neither of them do a lot of testing. It's a very, very big distinction between testing and research. Um, but it's one of those things that if you're Steve Jobs, you go be Steve Jobs. Um, for the rest of us, you should really, really be doing your homework. And then the other thing, which is the testing, you know, what we noticed is a lot of people aren't doing the testing as the data says. But what's also really, really interesting about this is a lot of us in our businesses, price intelligently and profit well included, we don't have enough traffic to truly test everything. Oftentimes we need to do a lot of research to get to maybe a very clear A-B test, and then that's something that we can test. Just for the fact of being a B2B SaaS company, even if we're driving you know, 55,000, 100,000 uniques, you don't necessarily have as many successes or as many failures to really account for many, many different tests that you could be running. So as I said, if you're Steve Jobs, be Steve Jobs. For the rest of us, you should talk to your customers. And we'll talk about a little ways that you can actually do that um, after this next point here. Now the final thing to set this up to actually kind of give you some tools that you can be using is this whole concept that we're focused way too much on acquisition. So many of the tactics that we talked about or I heard last night and some of the other ones that we've heard today are really, really focused on tofu, or the top of the funnel. What's interesting about that though is that what we found by looking at a lot of the data, and we'll share that in just a second, um, is that while we're focused exclusively on acquisition, it's not really the most effective lever for growth. So to kind of prove this out a little bit, we did a little anthropological study on blog posts. So the reason we looked at blog posts was mainly because we write about what we know. You know, if we nail a tactic, we're gonna write about it. And the other thing was is that we write about what gets us traffic. So if someone writes about Facebook channels and we all kind of share it and love it, we're more incented to write more about acquisition. And what was interesting is by looking at these 10,000 blog posts, between seven and eight out of 10 of them, they're written about acquisition. Um, retention was really around two out of 10 of them. And then less than one out of 10 were written about monetization, and sadly, most of those were written by Price Intelligently. Um, I don't know if that's sad or not, but it's sad because we want more pricing friends. Um, but to kind of continue this and kind of talk through why this isn't the most effective channel and kind of show what the data looks like, we built out a little bit of model with a, about 500 companies, 500 SaaS companies in particular. We wanted to answer the question that if we improve each of those main pillars of growth, acquisition, monetization, and retention, by the same amount or the same relative amount, what would the respective impact be on the bottom line? And what was interesting is if you improve your acquisition by 1%, so 
So meaning if you improve the number of leads that you have or you improve the efficiency of your conversion, you're gonna see about a 3% boost in your bottom line. Now if you improve your retention by 1%, how long those folks stick around essentially, you're gonna improve your bottom line by just under 7%. And as to not contradict myself, of course, um, if you prove your monetization by about 1%, raise your price, figure out your packaging, decrease your value metric in the right way, you're gonna see about a 13% boost in your bottom line. Now what's fascinating about this isn't the necessarily the absolute numbers here, but it's the relative impact that you're seeing in the differences of these approaches. And really the fact that focusing on your monetization and your retention, especially if you're a self-funded company, has two to four X the impact of focusing in on your acquisition. As Heaton and Steli were talking about, it's extremely easy to do what we know, right? Ship another feature, ship another blog post, do another AdWords test. But at the end of the day, some of these harder things or deceptively simple things that still require some work, those are the ones that might actually give us the biggest impact on our business, even though we keep kind of putting them to the wayside because we might not necessarily know or think we don't know how to actually approach them. But look at this data another way. This is a little bit more applicable to some of us since most of us aren't on kind of a venture path. Those companies that have no pricing function, meaning they just kind of set the prices up originally um, and they just kind of didn't look at them for a while or maybe look at them every five years, 1.68 LTV to CAC. So that's pretty abysmal. It means if you put a dollar in, you're basically getting 68 cents out. Yearly pricing review, these are folks who are changing their pricing up, not necessarily raising the price, but changing it, right over that three threshold, the 3.23. And then those folks who have continual price optimization, and what I mean by that is basically they're adjusting their packaging, their pricing, or even their positioning every single you know, six months or maybe every quarter at certain stages, their LTV to CACs are averaging out to about 11. So what this tells me, particularly around you know, dealing with a lot of these different companies, is that we really, really, really want customers, but we're not really sure what to do when we get them. And what's really fascinating about it is we focus on growth so much as a sledgehammer. A lot of our businesses, you know, some of the businesses that I've tried before Price Intelligently, I would focus on something for six months and not realize that there was a huge assumption that I was making and I was just spinning my wheels for six months before I actually fixed it. And that might be some of the stories that you guys have in here today, but if you focus on the right metrics, you focus on your customers, and ultimately you focus on the right levers that you should be pulling, that's where you're gonna see that growth, and ultimately that's, gonna see, that's where you're going to see where you can make a nice, big, successful business. So now that I've made us all feel bad, including myself, because there's a lot of stuff in here that we need to work on as well, um, how do we fix this? So how can we give you some frameworks, some tools, um, and even some more benchmarks around how you can actually make this better. Well, the first step here is quantifying your buyer personas. Everything starts with the buyer persona, and you know, if we talk afterwards, we talk whenever, the first thing I'm gonna talk about, because if you don't have that, a lot of times there's a lot of rippling implications around your business, because you're not gonna know what to test at the top of the funnel, you're not gonna know how to convert folks, and ultimately you're not gonna know how to price or retain those folks because you don't know those buyers deeply enough. Um, the second is implementing a pricing process. And then finally, implementing a multi-price mindset or using a value metric, which some of these folks talked about already today. So let's dig in. So buyer personas, as we talked about, look something like this. Most of the time, it's more of a bastardized spreadsheet. Um, it can have many, many different rows. It doesn't have to have just these things here. But really what you're trying to get to is understanding your buyer from your buyer's perspective and collecting data that allows you to know what they value, what their willingness to pay looks like, and then the unit economics so you know if you're targeting the right buyer, or sometimes you need to get rid of certain buyers, as Claire was talking about this morning. Now what's interesting, and just to hit the nail on the head here a little bit more, if you don't know who you're driving to that pricing page, just very, very flatly, you're not gonna know what to put on that pricing page. And pricing, because of all the different levers in terms of packaging, position, and the actual price, especially if you're a multi-tiered product, you can't test your way out of that hole. You have to talk to customers and make some very, very serious decisions. Um, so let's walk through an example, just because I think it helps, you know, I've taught pricing to a lot of folks, and I think, you know, it makes it a little bit concrete, but this is also my favorite part, because I get to talk about my mother. Um, and I like to title this, my mom's quilting business has better unit economics than your real business. Um, so for those of you who don't know, quilting, it's actually an interesting industry, um, but quilting's a hobby where people basically make blankets. If you've ever had a child or you've ever you know, had 
a child in your life, it's more than likely they've been given a quilt of some sort, a baby quilt. Um, and this is my mom, and she is the master at quilting. Um, it's basically her hobby. She's a trade show marketer by day. She quilts at night as her hobby. And what's interesting is I basically wanted to help my mom make a business that she could retire, essentially, um, and have enough you know, income to basically survive and, and maybe even grow an interesting business. And before you laugh, the quilting industry is actually a $4 billion industry. The median household income is about $126,000. And the average amount of money the average quilter spends per year is between five dollars and $6,000. So it's better than some sales teams and sales products, actually, which is interesting. Um, so what we did is we came up with this concept of we're going to do a box of the month club in the quilting world. Um, basically, whether it's supplies, patterns, whatever it was going to be, we we're going to put that in a box and sell it. And we figured if it's a $4 billion industry, we can figure out how to sell a few boxes at 100 bucks per month. Um, and that was just you know, assumptions. And that's kind of where you guys are at, right? Like You have a lot of assumptions about your buyers. So the first step was I sat down with my mom over lunch. And I basically said, all right, mom, what are the different groups of quilters out there? And this is kind of where you guys are at, right? You have different groups of your customers. You kind of know that, whether it's based on size or role or whatever it is. And we came up with five, but just for the sake of time, we're going to talk about two. Um, was Hipster Henrietta. So this is like a Brooklyn like hipster, like as the name implies, who thinks quilting's cool because it's old. Um, it is making a comeback. Like the median age for quilters is lowering over time. I'm just realizing I know more about quilters than I think I know about a lot of things. Um, and then the second persona here, uh, middle-aged Mary, which is basically my mom. She's a little older than middle-aged, but don't tell her. Um, and then I had my mom basically fill this out in terms of different hypotheses. So like, what do you think the most valued features given this product are? What do you think the least valued features? What do you think the willingness to pay looks like? Um, I had to explain to her what CAC and LTV were. And, I, and then she, I was like, how much do you think it's going to acquire? And we filled this out just very, very tactically over lunch, and we had to start, right? We had a central document that we could start iterating on, and every single data point that started coming in, we could validate or invalidate everything that we put into this particular grid and understand if we're improving on our buyers, but also understand who we should sell to. So to actually fill this out, though, for a lot of you guys, or to test this, you go to your customer. And like, for the love of God, just talk to your customer. Everyone's talked about it today in some form. It's really that important. And if you're not doing enough talking to your customer, just stop and start doing that. That feature can wait. That marketing campaign can wait. Because you're going to have such compounding effects when you get the right data from your customer base. And this is really important in the context of pricing. Um, because cost plus pricing and competitive-based pricing are just pure shit. Like, just going to say it like that flatly. Cost plus pricing in SaaS or even information products this makes zero sense. Um, your cost relative to an enterprise type you know, product or something in the hardware space really, really doesn't matter, especially in the sense that your marginal cost per user might be $1 to $3, whereas your revenue or ARPU on a monthly basis for that user might be in the triple digits. Um, to put it another way, like your customers don't care about your costs. They care about their costs. Um, and that's something that's really, really important to understand. Uh, particularly because a lot of people look at their costs and then they think, oh, well, let's look at our competitors as well. And competitors aren't that great either because, first of all, like, you're, you're sensing and you're seeding your value to that competitor. So, for instance, you're also assuming that your competitor's done their homework on their buyers. And judging by this room, like, it's pretty clear like, the savviest of us just haven't done our homework in terms of our buyers. But the other thing is you're probably not selling to the same type of buyer. So for instance, we used to use Salesforce. Um, we were, you know, we're a five-person sales team. And what was really fascinating about it is we didn't use 85% of the product. We were going after the wrong product, and we churned off of it very, very quickly, and we moved over to Close.io, mainly because that allowed us to have a little bit more of a product persona fit. And a lot of times, you guys are even in really competitive markets, such as CRM, the CRM space, you're focusing potentially on the wrong types of customers. And so what's cool about this is you do keep those particular inputs in mind, but you want to price based on value or use that as the main fulcrum to your business. And that's just kind of a very, very ambiguous way to say you want to talk to your customers, collect the right type of data, and then cross-reference it with your costs and your competitors to make sure that, well, one, you can have a business, and two, you're not 10x or 10% of your particular competitor because then something might be wrong with your data um, initially. So to do this, it's actually pretty straightforward. This is not rocket science. A lot of people anticipate really complicated formulas and like a magic secret. Uh, but really, it comes down to that customer development. 
So what you're going to do is you're going to start with that buyer persona that you've kind of figured out. Um, you have it down on a page somewhere, similar to what we did with my mom. You have some knowledge about your customers, make sure it's down on paper. You're going to set up an experimental design, which is a fancy phrase for just what type of surveys and what type of data are we going to collect from them. You're going to go out, you're going to collect that data, segment it down, which is probably one of the most important parts for discovering the right ways and right places to go for your customers. And then finally, consolidate and analyze it down, make a decision, and do it all over again. What we typically recommend is having between 10 and 20 different qualitative conversations and then following that up with a quantitative actual survey where you're collecting data at scale. And the reason for that is because a lot of times if you have that qualitative conversation set, you can actually pare down a lot of the different features or a lot of the different assumptions and then collect it at scale to kind of prove out if those assumptions are still true or if your hypotheses need a little bit of a different looking at. And the reason this is also important is because when you look at a pricing page or even any manifestation of a pricing page, you have two different axes here. You have the features on the x-axis and you have the price on the y-axis. And if you start to unpack your pricing page in that manner, you can start to collect data along those two different axes to get to your particular pricing uh, personas and make sure that you're aligning that particular data correctly for the best monetization strategy out there. And so in terms of experimental design, what we typically recommend is three different layers of data. So demographic information, and if you're a consumer product, you might actually have to collect like some traditional demographics, you know, age, um, household income, things like that. In the B2B space, this might be things like um, you know, company size, company revenue, et cetera. There's feature data that you're going to collect, and we're going to show you how to do that or how we recommend doing that. And then pricing information, which is ironically the most straightforward stuff to collect. And what's really kind of fascinating about this, particularly in the demographic information, what we'd recommend is never ask a question that you can reasonably get the answer to with a little bit of work. So what's really, really frustrating, and we see a lot of surveys, so our software, our algorithms are contingent on getting survey data, so we've sent about 15 million at this point. And what's really fascinating about it is we'll see a survey that asks for the first question, like for the email address, even though the company had sent the email address to, like, that's how they sent the survey to someone. And so just really make sure that you're battle testing what you're asking within these particular surveys because you don't want to piss people off. Like we've all had 45 question surveys that we just either didn't answer or we really just gave really bad answers to. Um, so typically you want to get a survey down to about four minutes or less and ideally it's between 30 and 60 seconds. And that also allows you to train your customer base or your user base to basically send surveys between every three and four weeks. Um, and you can do this in app. There's a lot of different ways you can get this data. If you don't have customers or you don't have prospects, you can use things like Ask Your Target Market, AYTM.com, or different market research firms. There's really no excuse for getting in front of someone who has this data. Now, the tools that we're going to use to get the x axis and the y axis data are one is called the relative preference analysis, and the other is a price sensitivity analysis. And we'll go through these in depth. If you have any questions, we do have blog posts that have been written on this, so you can do it all yourself. Um, and don't fear, don't fear the data. That's all I have to say here in terms of you know, digging into this. So what do people value? So we're going to start with that x-axis in terms of what features should go where, or even validating things like value metric, like which value metric should we sell on, pricing preferences. There's a whole host of things we can use. So what we're not going to do is ever ask a question like this ever again in the history of your company. These are the worst questions. Um, and it's intuitive why, right? Because you get data that looks like this where you can't really tell if one is really truly better than the other. Oftentimes what ends up happening is, if, especially if you have sales, marketing folks, um, you'll, everyone's a nine or a 10, right? Everything's important. Well, if you're gonna give me the option and not force me to make a decision, I want everything. Um, if you send these types of surveys to dev or more technically focused folks, um, typically what you'll, you'll get some true answers, but it's still not really a good statistical framework to use. Instead, what we recommend is using something called max diff. So max diff is a statistical model where you force someone to make a decision. So you take the same features that you were just about to do that nine to 10 ranking on, and you basically ask them, out of these four things, what is the most important and what is the least important? And the reason that this is so powerful is because on the back end, and the math is really, really simple, like trust me, like it really truly is, is you start to get not only that rank order, but you also start to get magnitude. So what I can tell is that this first feature is actually three to four times more valuable, at least from this customer perspective, than that second feature. And when I start to break this down by demographics, 
you start to notice really interesting things here, such as, oh, well, these wealthier folks really, really value this feature. Poorer folks don't value that feature, and vice versa for that second feature there. And so you can start to see how this can impact your pricing and impact your modeling, whether it's through marketing or sales. Now all of a sudden I know, like, well, we kind of need these things here, because these are most valuable. And if we want a point of differentiation, we can really separate these out. And ultimately, we're just not going to build that if this is the first things that we're building. Basically, because we've broken this down on a value by value basis, and if you know the demographics of your particular personas, all of a sudden you can start to break this down on a persona by persona basis. Now, this starts to become really, really powerful when you do it not only for kind of top level features, but when you start to break this out in kind of a, a you know, primary category and subcategory manner. So, what we mean by that is we might ask this main category question where we'll ask people to compare, for my mom's sake, basic quilting supplies, unique quilting supplies, patterns, other hobbies, et cetera. That's one question where we'll get a lot of information on a very, very categorical level. But in addition to that, we'll also ask a question, same, most least, around basic quilting supplies. They want thread, fabric, needles, et cetera. And what that allows you to do is basically figure out what's the most important category and then within that category, what's the most important item or feature in this case? What's cool about this is like taking this to a SaaS basis or even a software basis, is you might ask you know, your main, you know, main type of feature compared against support, compared against analytics, compared against you know, another type of you know, main feature integrations that you have. You might discover that support isn't the most important, but maybe it's like one of the least important, but then there's a really strong contingent of people who answered the support question with, I really, really want a dedicated account manager. And all of a sudden, that's the opening for a potential add-on that you might have intuitively known, but all of a sudden you have actual data to back this up. And when you break this down on a demographic basis, all of a sudden you have this rich tableau of data that allows you to figure out, well, maybe we still need to build this particular feature, but only if it's an infrastructure feature, or only if we think all the data for our personas is wrong, or instead, maybe let's focus on these features that people actually care about. And one objection to this oftentimes is, well, can't we just look at usage data? Um, which is interesting, right? Because what we found is that for about half of companies, usage does oftentimes correlate with value. It's not perfect, but oftentimes we also see that it doesn't correlate at all. And to give you an example, think of an accounting piece of software. Um, a lot of times invoices or invoicing will be the most commonly used feature from a usage perspective. I can just tell you with the six companies in the accounting space we've worked with, invoicing was never in the top, top half of features. It's just something that's very, very fascinating, and that's why you need to go to your customer to kind of figure out like, what they care about. And you'll also find that with a lot of this information, this helps in those sales conversations because if you're talking to a technical person, you might lead with the most important feature for that particular persona, and then mention some of the other features that are still potentially important to them, but you at least have an aggregation of that particular customer profile. So in that sense, we've now filled in for my mom in this particular case, what we can see in terms of most valued features and least valued features. Now willingness to pay, it's actually super straightforward as I mentioned. Um, on this side, what we're looking at is that Y axis. So we've started to figure out those X axes, and now we gotta go after what the willingness to pay looks like. We actually recommend asking these range questions. Now this model, it's something that was developed in the 70s and 80s, it's called the Van Westendorp model. And the reason that this works out so well, notice how we're asking range questions, is because human beings don't think about value as a single point in time. We think about value as a spectrum. So I know that this water bottle is less expensive than this laptop. It's a very, very intuitive thing that I just kind of know naturally. Similarly, I know both of these things are less expensive than this hotel. Very, very dramatic example, but you can take advantage of that psychological effect that we have to basically ask, you know, at what monthly price point is this particular product way too expensive to consider purchasing it? All the way down at, at what point is it too cheap that you question the quality of it? Um, and this one's actually particularly important um, in terms of people who are really insecure in their products, because oftentimes what we'll notice is, oh, your product is priced way too low that people just don't think you can fulfill the promise that you're trying to make. And when you translate this data to kind of a visual format and do some little bit of math that's fairly simple, we'll share the model afterwards, you can actually see that each of those particular questions aligns with one of these lines. So you see that at what point is it way too expensive 
At what point is it getting expensive? At what point is it a good deal? And at what point do you question the quality of it? You get this really, really nice diamond here that at least tells you for this particular persona the general place that you should be priced. And if you t go the extra mile here, you get this really, really nice elasticity curve. And this is basically comparing percent of sales lost versus price point. And the reason that's so important is because a lot of you folks, your products, you might not want to price at the lowest entry point. Because the ROI might be there where you might make two to three X um, the actual revenue on a particular customer, even though they're not necessarily an adoptive price. But even further, you might discover that those customers just suck for a different reason. Maybe they're really, really bad at you know, being retained by your product, or even further, they just might not be those customers that are gonna give you that growth over time that you really, really need. So we filled in the second part. Um, the last couple of pieces, there's a lot of articles that have been written about basically filling in things like CAC and LTV or estimating them. A lot of you probably have some sort of estimate right now or some basic intro data. Um, which I recommend kind of filling that in. For my mom, we basically looked at what the anticipated average number of clicks would look like um, for a couple of different channels. And then for the channels, which we're gonna test anyways, we basically looked at, all right, where are these people? And we did some really, really basic Google research. And all of a sudden, my mom here in this particular case knows, well, do I have a business? Let's look at the willingness to pay data versus what we anticipate CAC would look like. Measure that out. We know kind of the initial things that we would need to build or the initial things that we would need to market. And we also know kind of the channels that we're gonna start testing at. And what's fascinating about this is when you translate it into a pricing page, this is where a lot of the fun decisions start to happen because you're not gonna make everything perfect. Your buyer persona to pricing page conversion will just never be perfect and frankly, your pricing will never be perfect. It's just like your product's never perfect, everything's always iterating and you should treat your pricing similar to how you treat your product, similar to how you treat your marketing development, you should always be testing something. Um, and it doesn't mean just the price on the particular page. But in this case, we decided, all right, we're gonna get some, hopefully some network effects out of a free plan um, and we decided not to actually launch this until you know, we got a ton of data from these buyer folks um, and then we didn't even launch the community yet. So really we started with this basic quilting supplies box and a unique quilting supplies box. And what's really, really fascinating about this is this whole process took eight hours. Now I've done this before, but what's interesting about it is it wasn't eight hours like all in one swoop, but it was eight hours over a few weeks. And it only cost us $1,264. And that was because we paid about $2 per response on Ask Your Target Market where we could get quilters. Um, you can get anything from a soccer mom or dad in Kansas all the way to a Fortune 500 CIO um, one costs a little bit differently than the other. Um, but what's interesting is depending on you know, what your business and what stage you're in, a lot of this stuff could save you a ton of time and money. We did all of this before we even launched anything. And what's kind of cool about my mom in this case is we still have not launched a website. We launched the product. She's had about 5K MRR in the past, I think she launched it about four months ago. Um, and everything is through phone and everything is through pamphlets at quilt shops. Sometimes I joke that my mom's kind of a drug dealer because it's like, hey, you know, let's get, that was a joke, come on guys. No, uh, <laughs> she's not a drug dealer, you saw her. It was like very, would be a very weird drug dealer. But I joke, because she gets these calls which is like, oh, I saw the you know, quilt box at the quilt store, you know, I'd really like to sign up for this plan. Boom, booked. You know, she contacts them back and basically gets things through the door. It's amazing what you can do when you actually think about who those buyers are and what you can do with that data. So in terms of some of the other points here, implementing a pricing process. Um, this seems intuitive, but hopefully you guys have seen that this really isn't something that's super difficult. It just truly is a process similar to your, hopefully what you are doing some cust dev is, and also your product development, your road mapping, your marketing development. But what we recommend is you need to evaluate your pricing every three months. You don't need to do a huge research project, but you really should be meeting whether it's just you or your founding team or maybe your exec team depending on your size and you should be making changes every six months. And the reason that that's so important is because your product is probably improving at a much faster rate, and if your product is improving every six months, your price should be, improve, be improving every six months. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're raising the price. You might be lowering a value metric, you might be adding a feature, you might be moving a feature, you might be structuring your page a little bit differently. There's so many different things that you can evaluate with your pricing. And this process we typically recommend is this is no one's full-time job, so depending on your size, um, you might assign this to a VP of marketing or just your marketing hire or an intern even in certain cases. Meet in kind of the first week of the quarter, 
basically decide like, well, how's pricing going? Do we notice you know, some particular data point that came out last quarter, or is there something that we want to think about testing? Set up an experimental design and do some of this market research. And then depending on the severity of the change, if it's just something really, really minor that you don't need to announce to customers, just push it and, and make sure you're collecting data and testing on it. If it's something super, super um, important, you might do an impact analysis, and you might discover like, oh, we were only gonna raise the price $5, but we're estimating churn is gonna be out of control based on some of that elasticity data that we looked at. And if you find that, you might not make the actual change. And then if it's super big, what we recommend is going back to a customer advisory panel and basically showing them and saying, hey, we're gonna do this. Are we crazy? Um, don't ask it that way, but like, what do you think of what we're about to launch? And normally that'll give you, you know, did we miss anything? That'll give you some data on that particular access. And then if your team is big enough, what we typically recommend is having some representation from the core aspects of, um, of your business, product and marketing, finance and sales. And the reason for that is because pricing is so central to your business, everyone has an opinion. Um, and it doesn't mean those opinions are wrong or right, it just means that you wanna make sure that everyone's kind of going in the same direction with any pricing change that you might be making. But the most important aspect of this slide is making sure there's some sort of decision maker. A lot of times, you know, and, and Heaton talked about this um, in terms of calendaring, a lot of times we'll have people who collect a bunch of data, they'll look at the data for like a year, and they'll just never make a decision. Not because like they didn't want to, it's just because they didn't get enough consensus and they didn't put a decision point down on the actual page to make sure that they were coming out on top. And then the last point here is utilizing what's called a multi-price mindset. So if you remember from one of the benchmarks that we showed, expansion revenue is something that's pretty important, especially in the context, depending on what your gross churn looks like. That's how you can kind of overcome um, a lot of problems. But a lot of times companies that we see, and this is a, a graphic here that's showing growth from new users and growth from existing users, this is the relationship we see in a lot of companies that are those CAC fiends. In reality, you want both of these going up and to the right. And if you have both of these going up to the right, that means your net retention is over 100%. You have negative churn. And what's great about that is you can bake that into your model, just your pricing model, in a pretty simple way. One is through features. This isn't the best way, but a lot of you probably are already doing this, um, making sure that there's some sort of upsell opportunity where if someone churns out at the $49 plan and someone upgrades to the $149 plan, you've offset that churn and gained some. But the best way to do this is by using a value metric. So this is a company called Wistia. Um, they are also fairly self-funded. They have taken some funding. Um, but it's one of those kind of businesses where they do video hosting and analytics. Very slick product, very slick marketing. But what they've done is with their new pricing in particular is they're pricing based on number of videos. Um, and there's also kind of a bandwidth fair use limit to kind of protect their back end with someone who has like very, very few videos but huge amounts of usage. And what's cool about this is they have a ton of people, obviously, on these particular plans, and they might be churning, they might be upgrading, but they also have these really, really large companies. So they have people paying them thousands and thousands of dollars a month based on their usage because they scaled out this particular value metric. What that allows them to do is offset a ton of this short-end churn for some of those customers that might not necessarily be the best customers out there. Now, to set up a value metric, what we recommend is it's gotta basically align to your customer's needs. So per user pricing, interestingly enough, Oftentimes, if you really look at it, it does not align to your customer's needs. If you're a sales product, if you are a help desk, um, if you're something where someone logs in and sees something different than another person logging in, then you have a really, really good per seat type model that you could use. Most companies are using per seat model incorrectly and, and really should be using something like visits. Um, you know, if you're a DevOps product, there's just a world of things you could be using. Um, or if you're tied directly to revenue, you might actually use a revenue saved or revenue earned type model. Um, it's gotta grow with your customers. You should never be charging, or Wistia should never be charging, you know, the Disney channel the same price as price intelligently. Um, and further, it's gotta be easy to understand. And this is the hardest one, and this is why this like, little triumvirate is really hard to achieve, because oftentimes what ends up happening is you might have the perfect value metric. Well, we saved them $100 million last year, but it's so hard to like, get to where your value really is in that particular situation. Um, and so we recommend if you have a sales model, you can typically have a little bit more of a complicated value metric. But if you want something to be touchless, sometimes you're just gonna have to grit your teeth and your value metric might not be the greatest, but you might have something that kind of collates with your true, truly best value metric. So in all here, monetization matters. We went through some of that data. Um, I'm happy to talk more about pricing. Um, I am a little bit of a one-trick pony because everything led to pricing here. Um, 
But it's really, really important just to kind of recap here so you don't become one of those CAC fiends. You have to understand that you have to focus on the right metrics. And we're in a world now where there's no excuse for not knowing your metrics. There's, there's literally no excuse. There are dozens of ProfitWell competitors. Some, of them, you know, some are great, some are not so great. But what's awesome about it is I, I mean, I don't really care, well, I do care who you use, but frankly, I care more if you're actually understanding your metrics and focusing on the right parts of your business. Um, take customer development seriously. It's literally one of the biggest things that we see between companies that are succeeding and not succeeding. And finally, focus on your monetization more than you are currently. There's all gains that we can make around pricing. It's not a black box, it's not hard. You just have to make sure it's a process. Um, and finally, just understand we're all in the trenches. We all have a lot of knowledge. This isn't something that's super, super difficult. It just takes a lot of work. Um, and don't do work that is unnecessary, and don't do work that takes up too much time. Um, here's my email address if you ever want to chat. That's where the slides are, but appreciate the time. Um, when you're trying to figure out the willingness to pay, should you focus more on asking those questions to people who have never used your products so they're not biased, or should you ask your current paying customers? Yeah, great question. So ideally, you want three layers of data or three points of data. You want your customers, um, you want prospects, so people have heard of you but aren't using you, and then you want people who have never heard of you and um, are your target customer. So typically though, what we recommend is start somewhere. Like if you're very early, maybe you just go and get people who have never heard of you because those are the only people that are out there. Um, if you're a little bit later stage, like the path of least resistance might be fire up a survey and send it out to your current customer base. But what's really fascinating about some of this stuff is when you triangulate that data, all of a sudden you'll start to see like, okay, well someone who signed up in the past 30 days, how different they are than someone who you know, signed up six months later, um, or who's been on the product for six months. Um, or you can also, like it's always worrisome when you see that people who've never heard of you are willing to pay more. Um, but it, it helps you kind of level set what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. And there's a world where that data, and we try to use it this way a little bit, is actually better than things like NPS, because you get that elasticity data around that segmentation it really kind of helps you figure out like what we're doing right and who's willing to pay the most, what they look like, and who's not willing to pay and what they look like. Good question. That was, that was really good. I love when people like you go up and kind of make more of an abstract thing and say, these are the numbers, this is what you do, and this yeah, is the yeah. data. Um, the one thing I had a question about was, you talked about the, the price point, uh, similar to the, to the last question. Are you literally in the survey asking them at what monthly price does this become too expensive that you've never considered purchasing this thing? Is, yeah. that, is that how you're getting the data? It's an open-ended question, yeah. Um, and if you're talking to someone like one-on-one, -on -one, like you're doing one of those 10 to 20 first conversations, what we typically recommend is like don't ask all four, it's a little awkward in a conversation. Um, we typically ask what point is way too expensive and at what point is it a really good deal? Um, and you can qualify that too, like because sometimes an enterprise product it might be, oh this is way too expensive, I'll just hire someone. And so you can say like, well at what point like would you hire someone and at what point would you just like not talk to us unless there's an issue? And like that helps you kind of triangulate. Um, what you can do is, and, and the reason it's important to ask open-ended, even in surveys, is because you probably are going to anchor yourself in a weird way. Like, we know companies that have tripled their price, had no churn, and just didn't even grandfather people. And it's because they never did any of this research. And, like, they discovered, oh, wait, we're, like, we're, we're not priced, not only we're not priced correctly, we're priced, like, so low that people just think we're not a good product. Um, so if you do this more and more, you might be able to start adding you know, different attributes, meaning maybe you say 100, 50, 75, you know, some, some actual inputs, because your survey data like, response rate will go up. But I mean, we've seen great response rates even on open-ended. Yeah, sorry, rambled there a little bit in two couple of points, but that's, yeah, that's what we recommend. Rob, we have a question over here. Hey. You mentioned that uh, most companies are using per-user pricing incorrectly. Can you give some thoughts on what uh, correct usage might look like? Yeah, exactly. So there, there's a couple of ways. One, like I kind of said, what litmus is, is if you log in and your experience is different, meaning like there's actual, like people aren't going to share logins and get the same, same experience, that's a good way to actually price. Um, the other way, the other kind of litmus is if you look at per user pricing in particular, and you notice that the cap on the number of people in an organization to use your product, even if they're a really large company, is relatively low, 
Like think about a marketing team. Like a marketing team at like a venture back startup in a Fortune 500 company, a, a department, not necessarily the whole, comp the whole marketing team, relatively the same size, right? So the value doesn't necessarily correlate to more usage. Um, those are a couple of things that I would look at. Um, sales, help desks, um, you know, Slack, those types of products um, are really, really useful because people have different experiences. Um, if you have a product that people will share a login or people won't upgrade because they don't have more users even though they're using the product, sometimes what you can do is limit users on the lowest tier. So HubSpot does this really well where they'll limit the users on the lowest tier and then you know, once you get up to the next tier it's unlimited. Uh, mainly because they're trying to protect small teams with big traffic or big contact rates, essentially. So we've, we've wrote a like, pretty big article on this, too. I can share it um, afterwards. Or if you download this stuff, I can share it with the, the group as well. Good question. All right, we have time for one more. Hi, um, my name is Joe, and I have to caution you. I'm, I'm kind of bushwhacking in the swings. I knew you were coming, and I had this question in my head. Oh so uh, it's Can't just um, yeah, it's a it's a tactic I've been uh, toying with. I've done some basic experimentation, but we don't have enough data yet to make sure it'll work. I kind of want to gamify my pricing. Ooh, I want to be able to love it. Right. So I'm not sure if I love it yet. I'm, I just like to get your opinion, and maybe you won't have one, but it's just an sure. idea. Um, how about if I give uh, five percent off to every customer uh, who r brings me a referral, and that mm. that new referral's got to be in the system. So he's going to yeah. be looking at a dashboard where he sees. Uh, you know, I brought in five guys and one of them fell off, so now I'm only getting a 20% discount instead of the 25 I got last month. Mm. Maybe take it down to some minimum. Um, but it happens that we're targeting a business that is itself very referral friendly. It relates to real What's estate. What's the industry? Um, it's real estate, call it that. No, more, oh, mortgage okay. brokers in particular. Yeah. Um, so these guys are accustomed to referrals. They, they, you know, that's a big part of their own business. That's familiar to them. Um, and the math kind of works. It may, and when you take it down to a certain level, you end up getting you know a, a reasonable percentage and increased rates. Yeah. Ever heard of something the like math, that? And, and the math works like on a spreadsheet that you made. Or yeah. You know, you just you, how much am I giving away okay. to, to acquire those new customers? Okay. It's it's a tolerable amount. So yeah. So what do you? The, so the, the basic thing, idea of gamifying and getting yeah. customers involved in uh, pricing as a referral model. Sure. So so you're you're essentially incenting. Okay, so there's a company called Paribus. Have you heard of them? No, they, you connect your Amazon account and then they just crawl for any price decreases. And then like if they see a decrease, they'll pass it on to you and they'll take a cut. They do this, like it works really well in consumer-based businesses. I think the problem in, in B2B is that like one, like referrals, it's, that naturally kind of happens at the highest rate already, if that makes sense. Like no one's truly figured out like B2B referral systems unless there was some like network effect in the product. Like Slack, like I add you to a group, therefore I start using Slack, then I might open up my own channel. My other issue with that, um, and I'm not saying it can't work, like it's something interesting to test, but I would, I would question like, why don't you just do like traditional referrals? Like you get $100 off or something like that and, as a credit. And the reason for it is because when you get into all those percentages, you're basically giving a discount to that new customer for doing what they should already kind of do based on like how good your product or experience is. I know that's really easy to say. Like, I know I'm like standing here and I'm like, yeah, do that. But like, I think oftentimes you never want discounting. And I know someone asked it, but like, discounts they should never. They should always have an expiration date. Like, people who give like lifetime discounts, it's like, well, you should just lower the price to that point if that's the only way you can acquire those users. Um, but one thing you might look at is actually free, um, some sort of free product. So like free, just to keep in mind, like we always get asked about free with pricing, but like free is an acquisition model. It's not a revenue model. But what's really fascinating that's happening across all these companies is that the, the basically the, the willingness to pay per feature is steadily going down. And so there's always this debate of like, all software is going to zero, right? Because people are actually paying for value now more. And you can see that with more complicated revenue models. So now things like AWS, like you don't pay a set monthly price, you pay a monthly price based on a bunch of different inputs, like those value metrics. And so what I would say is like, give a feature rich product that has some sort of um, you know, value metric tied to it, so number of leads or number of something, and then like, that can act as or either as like, an interesting first trial or free trial, basically, like in disguise, or it can act in a way that like, you can actually like, get those upgrades and at least nurture that lead over time. So I would just, I would just think about that a little bit because like, referral tactics in B2B, like, it's really hard to get them to work. 
Um, affiliate stuff in B2B works really well, but it's, it's one of those things where like, you know, if I'm using a tool, I'm already gonna tell someone about it. Like, you don't really need to incent me too much. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good, thanks for your input. Thanks yeah. again, Patrick.